Uh, Philippians chapter 2 is where, where we go. Um, so out of the Psalms. So we covered the, the hymn, the hymn of Christ. Uh, we covered part of that this morning, and we'll read that tonight as our, as our opening. So Psalm 2, and we'll start at verse 5. Psalm 2? Oh, I'm sorry, Philippians 2. My brain's going in many directions. <laughs> For once. <laughs> you have to, I don't know what you put in this tea. <laughs> Did you give me some kind of crazy, crazy tea and just to see what I'd all say tonight? <laughs> so Psalm, uh, Psalm, man, I am stuck. I am stuck. Philippians chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 5. So if somebody wants to read 5, 5 through 11, that'd be great. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to a point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that <clears throat> at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah, may it, may it be so. Well, all right, we are uh, looking at three chapters tonight. So 46, 47, 48. Um, 48, I'm going to leave, yeah, not, not a whole lot of time for uh, chapter 48. Uh, but 46, uh, as we talk about uh, the power of the church. So uh, Grudem defines the, the power of the church. You know, does, does the church have any power or even authority uh, to do things? And so where, where are we as a church? And so uh, he says we may define the power of the church as follows. The power of the church is its God-given authority to carry on spiritual warfare, proclaim the gospel, and exercise church discipline. So spiritual warfare, proclaiming the gospel and exercising church discipline, uh, essentially saying that's where we need to be engaging uh, as, as a church. Uh, that's where we can uh, make, make a difference. So in those three things, as we think about them, uh, spiritual warfare, uh, that's uh, something that we just came out of a sermon series on Ephesians uh, 6, 10 through 20. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful. I know it was helpful for me in, in settling a few things and, and kind of, uh, you know, say, putting things in their proper place. Uh, I think even with the, uh, the, the spiritual warfare, uh, as we think about that, uh, we, we may... Uh, immediately when you think of or hear the word spiritual warfare, you may think in terms of exorcisms, um, you know, some movies that you watched where uh, somebody was possessed and some priest came and, and did some sort of exorcism or uh, spiritual warfare. You may think in terms of um, the, the church telling the devil what he can or can't do or, you know, somehow, somehow binding the devil and and spiritual warfare is, is often uh, portrayed uh, as, as our, uh, some sort of activity with uh, demonic forces. Uh, when we think about spiritual warfare, though, we need to make sure that we're starting very clearly in Christ. 
uh, that's the starting point. Uh, when Paul gives us his, uh, the Bible really, uh, the best summary of spiritual warfare is Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Uh, that's where it's given the, the most uh, words, if you will, and number of verses together uh, addressing that issue. And so if you turn to Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 6, I think there were some key key things, and this is kind of veering from um, from Grudem to to some degree. So Grudem would say, "Yeah, there we we are in a spiritual battle, and we would agree with that. Uh, there is this this battle that we are in. Uh, we would agree that this world that we live in uh, is not our playground." Uh, it's our battleground, and uh, that danger lurks. Uh, we have an enemy who seeks to uh, steal, kill, and destroy, who seeks to devour, and so to walk around as if this is our playground in this world uh, is a little bit naive, right? Uh, that's probably saying it kindly. So when we get to Ephesians 6 at verse 10, and we're told about the armor of God. We're told to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. And what we may not read right away is that that is a, uh, in, in the passive form, meaning that we are to receive strength from the Lord. Uh, it's not written in the sense where it's like, all right, you see the Lord, you see how awesome He is, now you go and be awesome. You know, uh, be strong in Him. Uh, no, it's, it's literally be strong in him, meaning that we have to have union with him, uh, which was talked about a couple weeks ago, right? Union with Christ. Uh, in union with Christ, we are strong because his strength is our strength. Okay, that's, that's the point that's being made from Ephesians 6. And even as... Um, Paul goes down and, and lists these things about being being strong and being or finding this uh, having the strength of his might and putting on the whole armor of God uh, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Paul doesn't go on. So now here, let me you got to stand against the schemes of the devil. So let me explain to you all the schemes of the devil. He doesn't do that. What he does is he explains the whole armor of God because the whole armor of God is that which enables us to stand against whatever the schemes of the devil are. So if we're well acquainted with the truth and the truth of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, uh, the peace of the gospel, uh, the, the shield of faith, if our faith is strong and firm in Christ, uh, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, if all of those are uh, rightly uh, put on uh, through prayer, we will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Uh, and so why do we have the armor? And this is, uh, this is part of what uh, Grudem is talking about here with the power of the church. Uh, we're to conduct spiritual warfare. I think in a sense I, I may have... I may have swapped that in, in that order, proclaiming the gospel. I would have put that first. So we are called to go and proclaim the gospel. Christ says in, if you want to look at it, Matthew 28, which is known as the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Uh, who, who knows part of that? What's, what's verse 18? 19 is, the, uh, 19 is the go, therefore. What's 18? Yeah. So, yeah, Jesus tells his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go, therefore. And he doesn't say go, therefore, and conduct spiritual warfare. He says go, therefore, and make disciples. So go and preach the gospel. Ow, oh, but beware, while you're preaching the gospel, you're going to run into opposition because you're preaching the gospel in enemy territory. Okay, so that's why Paul, even at the end of Ephesians 6, 
you know, says that as an ambassador, you can expect to be an ambassador in chains to some degree, uh, meaning that you're an ambassador uh, who isn't given the red carpet treatment and all these special privileges in a foreign land. You're an ambassador in chains because you're representing Christ in enemy territory. So I don't know if that makes sense or not, but so I would put proclaiming the gospel would be uh, what the church has been called to do and the power the church has been given is to go and preach the gospel and knowing that in preaching the gospel, there will be those that hear and receive, believe, and become part of the kingdom. So he talks a little bit about the keys of the of the kingdom in B. Uh, so in Matthew chapter 16, in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, where uh, there's there's uh, there's talk of keys. I guess in 18 there's not. But. So the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So what are these keys uh, that have been given uh, in verse 19? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Yeah, and so he doesn't mention keys again in 18, but he mentions uh, binding and loosing again in um, chapter 18 of Matthew, verse 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So he's asking, what, what do you think the, the keys uh, of the kingdom of heaven are? And if you think about keys, what do you use with keys? I mean, what do you do with keys? Open and close. Yeah, you open, you open that which is locked, or you lock something and you open something. You, you either lock it or loose it or open it, right? Bind or loosen. So uh, a key, whether literal or metaphorical, always implies authority to open a door and give entrance to a place or realm. Uh, so in a sense, he's saying the keys of the kingdom... Uh, would be about preaching the gospel, proclaiming the kingdom, and inviting people to trust in Christ. So do we each have that key, in a sense? Are, are each of us able to preach the gospel and uh, invite somebody to trust Christ? And... Yeah, we're all ambassadors. No. So not not just pastors. Men are women. <laughs> we'll get to that next chapter. All right. <laughs> So in, in chapter 16, it's like uh, Jesus promises, uh, Grudem writes here, promises to give not only the authority to open the door of entrance into the kingdom, but then in chapter 18, he talks about binding and loosing in a, in a way that says some of the administrative authority to regulate the conduct of people once they are inside uh, as well. So in chapter 18 is where you would... Uh, kind of go to to begin your understanding or, or start from in the New Testament an idea of church discipline. So that's something else that uh, Grudem tackles in this chapter. So before he gets there, though, he goes to the power of the church and the power of the state. I kind of just wanted to skip right over that, but... Um, so as Baptists, we, we believe very much uh, in the separation of church and state. Uh, we believe that the state has been given a particular, uh, particular mandate from God, and the church has been given a particular mandate from God. And we don't believe the church should ever try to become the state. 
Um, it needs to be separate and distinct uh, because once the church becomes the state, then uh, the, the church has the power to coerce people into the church uh, and entrance into the church is never by coercion. Um, Leroy always says, a, a man convinced against his will is unconvinced still. Uh, so you can't, you can't force people uh, to belong to a church. And so, uh, yeah, we would very much hold to the uh, separation of, of church and state. That doesn't mean that we as Christians shouldn't try to influence the state, uh, that we shouldn't try to allow our, our ethics, our morals, our understandings of how people should behave. Uh, we should very uh, much be able to bring that into any position that we have within the state. Uh, but we should never try to make the state become the church. So uh, Jesus, uh, when he was, uh, was asked about paying taxes, uh, he grabbed a coin and, and uh, he said, Who's, whose image is on this coin? Right? And so then it was the image of Caesar. And so his comment was, render to Caesar's, that which is Caesar's, and render to God that which is God's. And so the image of the coin was Caesar, so yeah, pay your taxes. Uh, but whose image is stamped on us? Right? So we're made in God's image. Uh, so we're to, although pay, pay our taxes, we give ourselves to God. So yeah, membership in the church and allegiance to Christ must be voluntary. So Baptists talk about that as like the, uh, not only in churches, like autonomy, but in individuals, uh, we would call it uh, soul competency or the, uh, yeah, maybe just yeah, the competency of the soul before God. Like each, each person is... Uh, to stand before God on their own. And so you can't force somebody into believing. You can't, uh, you can't somehow say, all right, these are all with me, and they're in underneath my belief. Uh, each person is going to have to stand before God uh, on their own. Uh, and so you can't, you can... You can manipulate and uh, get people to make confessions of faith. Uh, but you, can't, you can't force belief. Uh, so, which drives us back to prayer and faithfully proclaiming the gospel and inviting people to trust in Christ. So, and that may lead to uh, even uh, a society that uh, can become, you know, if you, if you believe in the separation of church and state, what you're saying is, is that you're, uh, you'd rather see a, the state go off the rails than the church. And you're willing to maintain the purity of the church, even though uh, the state uh, may flounder and, and, for lack of better terminology, go off the rails. So, so he's, uh, the civil government should not enforce laws requiring or prohibiting kinds of church doctrine uh, or abridging the people's freedom to worship as they choose. I like what Grudem writes here. We could say, well, if we don't, if we don't enact a bunch of Christian laws and um, even laws stating that Christian worship must be the, the right worship, uh, then we're going to allow all kinds of other belief to come into our culture. And at some point, you're right. But as Grudem says, the Christian faith can stand on its own two feet and compete very well in the marketplace of ideas in any society and in any culture, provided it has the freedom to do so. So in one sense, I would say from my perspective, I'm more concerned about um, 
maintaining religious freedom in our country than trying to convince people that we're a Christian nation. Religious liberty is more important in my, my understanding of things. Any pushback there or? All right, church discipline. Church discipline, um, in a general sense, uh, every, I, well, I say every church, but generally speaking, most churches have uh, some level of church discipline. Uh, it may not be uh, super, super organized, uh, but church discipline is, is really, in a sense, understanding uh, that we as Christians are to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And church discipline is really an aspect of church discipleship or Christian discipleship is, is all it is. Um, and the way you'd want that to work um, naturally or uh, work uh, in a way that's just... It feels more seamless, more organic, maybe is the word, is that, um, you know, there would be a measure of discipline in the home, encouragement to keep trusting in Christ. And then there would be uh, individuals as a, in, in the church, you know, maybe men holding men accountable, women holding women accountable. There's accountability within families. And so all in all, we're trying to create an environment in which we keep encouraging each other to say no to sin and yes to Christ. And that's the essence of it. Now, what he's talking about in this chapter with church discipline is what if it gets to the point where uh, something has to be done because uh, somebody has gone too far and is not submitting to any type of accountability and then what do we do? So he talks about uh, the purpose of church discipline. Uh, church discipline is never designed just to really lay the hammer on somebody. That's not the goal of church discipline. Uh, the goal of church discipline uh, must be uh, restoration and reconciliation. So restoration, uh, Grudem defines as the offender uh, is returning to right behavior and reconciliation means that there is a return to a right relationship between other believers and an individual and also with God. So the purpose uh, of church discipline, restoration, uh, that's one of them. And then he also talks about to keep sin from spreading to others. Uh, that's, that makes sense as well. There's, you, you don't want certain things spreading, right? Um, we, should, we should know all about that, having come through a couple of years of COVID, right? We don't want things spreading. So uh, what about sin? Uh, we need to keep sin from spreading to others. Uh, so we've got to treat sin appropriately uh, to protect the purity of the church and the honor of Christ. So Ron last week talked about the purity and the unity of the church. So uh, church discipline in one sense is meant to help protect the purity of the church, not just the purity, I would say also the unity of the church. So there needs to be church uh, discipline, church discipleship that sometimes leads to a form of discipleship called discipline. Now, uh, what sins should church discipline be exercised on or for what sins should church discipline be exercised? So that's always a good question. So what gets called out, what gets addressed and what doesn't get addressed? And why should some things get addressed and other things not be addressed? Any thoughts there?
some first thoughts, um, like unrepentant sexual immorality, or at the very least, uh, like the Corinthian is an example, like was having an improper relationship with uh, was it mother-in-law or something? Right. Yeah. Some some form of incest. Yeah. So we have some examples in the Bible of people who were disciplined. So that's 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, there's an example of discipline. Can you guys think of any other examples of discipline? Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira. That discipline was pretty uh, uh, quick. Yeah. That's a very striking example. <laughs> For sure. And... After that, what, what, what was the comment? And uh, it was like, and, and there, was, there was fear. Like, they were like, oh man, this is serious business, right? Um, can you think of any other examples of church discipline in the scriptures? Well, you can think of God in, in the Old Testament. You probably think of some, but in the New Testament in particular, can you think of any? Think of the Old Testament, right? Uh, the sin of Achan. And his whole family just getting swallowed up, you know? This guy, this one guy wanted to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit and hack the maturity. Okay, was that, was that Elimus or Elimus, Elimus or something, the sorcerer? Or Simon the Magician? Simon the Magician. Simon the magician. Yep. Um, Okay. Alexander. I don't remember Hymenaeus. Hopefully, that's not the name you pick for your first son that you're going to have someday, right? No. <laughs> so yeah, that's at the end of First Timothy chapter one. Um, it talks about uh, yeah, Hymenaeus and Alexander, uh, and that's verse twenty. Paul says, "Whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme." Okay. So let's let's put together what. What we might know about spiritual warfare, preaching the gospel, uh, the keys of the kingdom, and then Paul saying, here's Alexander and Hymenaeus, they've made shipwreck of their faith, and what I've done is I've handed them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. What in the world does that mean? Does, does Grudem address that one? So think, think in terms of the, uh, the, the authority, uh, the keys of the kingdom. Um, it's, it's not so much that we get to say who's in and out of the church, um, but that it's associated then with Christ. Like it's Christ is the, the entry point of the church. Right? You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be part of the church. Here's the gospel. Preach the gospel. Somebody believes the gospel. Uh, and they enter into the church. And then, as they go on, they start exhibiting uh, the behavior of an unbeliever, and they continue in unbelief, or they make shipwreck of their faith, uh, meaning that their faith no longer informs how they live. And so Paul, in handing them over to Satan, is essentially saying what? Right. So he's, he's essentially saying uh, they are no longer part of the church. They are no longer under the, the protective umbrella of what we know as the church. They're no longer part of the church family. They, uh, their, their, their faith is outside. It's not in Christ. It's, and so we're, we're 
in a sense, they're no longer in the church and they're back in the world and therefore we're handing them over to Satan and maybe in doing that, they'll learn that, wait a minute, hmm, I think the faith is true and it is good and we do need to repent and we, we do need to trust in Christ. And so even in Paul saying, I'm going to hand them over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme, there's restoration in that. There's reconciliation in his tone, if you will, or even in his, in his hopes there. He's not like, just hand them over to Satan and that'll teach those bums. You know, like he's not doing it out of uh, anger, hoping that they will ultimately be destroyed. I think even in that, he's saying, well, um, well, we'll see, why don't you see how it is uh, outside the church. Now, that's language that's not, yeah, it's the language we, we don't typically use today, all right? So again, um, he doesn't go through a whole list of saying, well, here's a sin that you need to address. Here's a sin that you don't need to address. Uh, the one that he addressed in uh, Matthew, well, right away, he talks about Matthew 18, 15. Um, he talks about how uh, sin progresses from a private and informal situation to a public and much more formal process of discipline by the whole church in Matthew 18. And then he gives some examples of discipline there at the bottom of page 1105. And then at the top of 1106, he says, a definite principle appears to be at work. All sins that were explicitly disciplined in the New Testament were publicly known or outwardly evident sins, and many of them had continued over a period of time. And so one of the, one of the things is um, yeah, are you, are you working with somebody and there's, you know, it, it's private uh, or is it public and uh, are you concerned about the, you know, the reputation of the church? Uh, those types of things come into play when uh, you're dealing with sins. Uh, and I would say, go ahead. question is, so we live in a Christian community Responsibility for us as a believer or as a friend, or well, I would say if we're we're a brother and we're a friend, uh, we would certainly. I, I think we would want to say something. Now, if if somebody belongs to another local church, uh, we we can't exercise church discipline from a church that uh, he's not a member of. But I, I think we would want to, yeah, that, and, that, and that gets, yeah, that gets a little bit tricky. But again, it's, it's the relationships we have, and that's why, like here at a local level, we are, we make a covenant with one another to um, uh, behave uh, in a certain way as well as to receive instruction and to receive correction. So Matthew 18 if you see the, uh, see the progression that, that takes place there in Matthew 18, starting at verse 15. Uh, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Uh, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Uh, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So... 
you, you keep, it, keep it small. <clears throat> if it's between you and your brother, keep it between you and your brother. Uh, if, if you and your brother can't figure it out, then it says uh, add a couple more in there uh, so that they can help you figure it out. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, if I go to somebody and say, hey, uh, you've done this, this, and this, and you need to repent. Uh, well, I don't agree with you completely or whatever. And, oh, uh, well, all right, I'm going to go grab a couple elders. And we're going to, well, the job of the elders isn't to back me up necessarily. The job of the two or three, if it's elders or even if it's two or three other people, they're there to get the facts and to say, okay, uh, no, this is... You know, you're, you're right here, but you're wrong here, and you're right here, and you're wrong here. And to help establish what's right and good so that you can move forward, and that way there can be reconciliation and restoration. Because um, sometimes if we go and confront somebody, uh, we may not understand exactly everything that's going on. We may need some help in our blind spots, too. So that's why you bring in a couple others. And so if that solves it, great. It doesn't need to go any further. But if that doesn't solve it, if, if the several say to the one that, no, you need to repent here. This is clearly an issue on your part. And they're like, uh-uh, not going to repent. Nope, no way. Uh, well, then it says to bring it to the church. Uh, you know, and even there, says, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And again, right there, he's saying, let, let him be to you then as an unbeliever, one who needs to be evangelized, uh, one who needs to be won over to Christ, uh, not one that needs to be ridiculed or mocked or shamed or anything like that, but one who needs to be uh, evangelized. But there's, you're seeing... Uh, you're moving from treating him as a brother to treating him as a Gentile. And Gentile is, is someone who doesn't know God. So then he says, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So that even fits in with... Um, Corinthians... Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, where it talks about lawsuits against believers. Uh, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? And so uh, even there, there's a sense that there are certain things that should be able to be handled in-house. There are certain things that should be, should be able to be decided on by uh, trusted brothers and sisters in Christ who have the heart and mind of Christ and want to see Christ exalted. Um, and there's no need to take certain things to court or to take them to uh, the world. Uh, you know, when he's saying, in the end, uh, we're the ones who are going to be judging the world, not the world judging us. So certainly we can judge ourselves, right? Now, I'll be quick to add there that uh, in matters in which there has been um, uh, illegal activity, law-breaking, uh, you can't act as if somehow the church can handle those things. Um, for example, uh, if there's a case of sexual abuse within the church. You don't say, well, we're not going to get the law involved. Uh, we're just going to handle that in-house. Nope. Uh, the law needs to be involved. Uh, so you can't, you can't act as if you're a state unto yourself, right? But there are some things that don't need to be brought out. They should be handled here. Anyway, I don't think he covers all that. So I am getting off topic, and I apologize. So he talks about uh, knowledge of the sin should be disclosed only to those who need to know. I think that's very important to keep the circle as small as possible. Only make it bigger as needed. 
disciplinary measures should increase in strength until there is a solution. So that's another principle to follow. Uh, and then what about the discipline of church leaders? Uh, Paul deals specifically with that in 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 21. Uh, one of the things he says is never entertain a charge against an elder uh, except by two or three witnesses. So you can't just have one person say, hey, I'm going to level a charge. You know, if one person has an ax to grind with me, and levels a charge against me, but there's no witnesses, there's no additional witnesses or other people to corroborate the story or anything like that. Um, you know, then you kind of rack it up as, well, that seems questionable, a questionable charge. But if the charge isn't questionable, there's, you know, two witnesses, three witnesses, whatever, uh, then uh, there, I would say a church leader, uh, myself included, uh, if there's something to be brought against me, it should, uh, yeah, the, the church needs to know. So, uh, just because of, just because of the position. So, so there may be a, uh, say, held to a different standard uh, to some degree. You guys have any other? Uh, let me see what they've got in here for. So just by uh, review, what are the three primary reasons for church discipline? So kind of big picture stuff. Three primary reasons for church discipline. So sin doesn't spread. That was the second one he gave. Restoration. Okay. Yep. Restoration, reconciliation. So changed behavior and a restored relationship. Restored behavior and reconciled relationship. Uh, so that's the first two and the third one. Protect the purity of the church, right? The reputation of, of the church. Yep. What do, do churches without official membership need for church discipline? How does that work? I, I'm not sure they do anything besides just organic things. Uh, so one of the modern difficulties of church discipline uh, is the ease at which people can just change churches. Um, I mean, it just... Um, so, yeah, in, in, order, in order to have meaningful discipline, there has to be meaningful membership. Uh, if there's not meaningful membership, uh, then basically what church is viewed as is a, um, a, a, a spiritual store in which people who are looking to grow spiritually come and consume the product of that particular church. And if that particular church is actually trying to say, no, we're not just here to give you products that you want. Uh, we're here to help you grow. And that means we're going to confront or correct. And uh, there's that dynamic too. Uh, a lot of people say, no, 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 wait a minute. I'm just going to, I just want to go where I get what I want and I get to choose what, what I want and what I participate in. And uh, so we, in a, in a very consumer driven church culture, uh, church discipline is a very difficult thing to navigate. Uh, we can try to encourage it and, and build a culture of it in which you're inviting like every every membership meeting that that we have we try to uh, incorporate this this idea that um, you're not perfect but you're also joining a church that isn't perfect we're growing and we are here to hold each other accountable and we're to grow in Christ together and that means you know if you see something I'm doing that's not right uh, you need to have the freedom and the, the understanding that you are to say something as well. Uh, and then vice versa. And because we are agreeing that we want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Um, but 
I think there's a lot of, well, I, yeah, I can't say, I've, I've heard of, um, I've heard of people being able to join churches just by saying, hey, I want to be a member. Awesome. Uh, give me your phone number, your address, and your birth date, your anniversary, and all of that, and great. You're a member. Like, uh, no vote, no rehearsal of doctrine or anything like that. It's just kind of like, you want to be here and you want to be a member? Great. You're a member. Well, what, what kind of... Uh, what kind of accountability is that going to create? You know, that's kind of, uh, you can be a member as long as you want to be, <laughs> right? So that's a very consumer-driven mentality. So uh, I don't honestly know how churches do it without formal church membership. Uh, I, like, I like the idea that when somebody wants to become a member, that will go through the statement of faith with them. Mm -hmm. And if they don't agree... That's up to them. Right. But to allow, to tell them where the church stands, I think, is, is so beneficial in solving some of these issues before they even have to arise. Right. Yep. Yeah. So you try to do some of that work on the front end. Yep. Yeah, and church discipline also can't be it also can't become a very rigid, legalistic type thing either. Um, like cases need to be handled individually, and um, there's, there's not kind of a, a one-size-fits-all one dynamic to church, church discipline. Yeah, it's a... Yeah, I would say it's it's an area in ministry where um, I probably well I do deal with some yeah just some regret and um, a little bit of hesitancy on how to move forward in some cases. So it's a uh, so like part of it is is yeah. Teaching, teaching people what the church is, what membership is, uh, what it looks like to grow in Christ, and uh, it's important to do to do that type of work. So, even the review of on Sunday mornings, yeah, I think is very very helpful. Yep. for those that are visiting and don't know our church, you can see that. All right. Well, good discussion. Um, chapter 47. Uh, church officers, I'm just going to like kind of whip through this first part, okay? Um, So we would believe that the, the two officers of the church are elder and deacon. Uh, those are the two that the Bible specify. Uh, and the other names for elder would be what? Um, in Ephesians 4.15, maybe. Yeah, pastor, teacher. So uh, that'd be a function for sure. But like bishop, the... Um, Timothy talks about a bishop, uh, overseer, uh, and pastor. So pastor, elder, overseer, bishop would be like titles. Um, Teacher is mentioned in Ephesians 4, 15, where it talks about uh, Christ giving the church uh, first apostles, then prophets, then evangelists. And then um, there's a question whether pastor, teacher is two separate things or uh, is to be seen together, pastor, teacher. Uh, but yes, teaching is a function, for sure, of, of elders, uh, as you read through the qualification for elders in 1 Timothy 3, and then also in Titus 1, uh, there is a teaching function that's not listed for the qualifications for deacon. Okay, so that's one of the distinctions made between elder and deacon.
uh, apostle. Uh, he goes through and he makes the case that uh, although there are people today who may call themselves apostles and there are those that uh, would even say that there are continuing apostles in the church, uh, Grudem makes the argument that apostle as understood in the New Testament is a position that has since ceased with the original um, apostles, however many there are. So how many apostles were there? Fifteen. Fifteen. Oh, I've been reading. Good job. <clears throat> so he's saying, he's saying there, there's at least like 15 that we know of, uh, so more than the 12. And so could there have possibly been a few more? Maybe. Um, so but I think that's important to understand uh, his, um, yeah, the, the idea of whether apostle is an ongoing thing or if that's something that has uh, ceased. Uh, I think one of the, one of the things that's kind of con conclusive for me um, is that uh, Paul uh, refers to himself, in a sense, last of all, uh, almost like I was, I was g called to be an apostle uh, last of all in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 9. Uh, so bottom of page 1122, elder pastor, or elder is pastor, overseer, bishop. Uh, the function of the elders, uh, they're to exercise governing authority uh, and teaching responsibilities are the main uh, two main things uh, for elders. Uh, the qualifications for elders, as I said, are listed in 1 Timothy 3. Also, Titus 1, 6 through 9. So he handles the, the one husband of one wife, handles that. Uh, he talks about uh, deacons and then other offices. And, of course, here we have treasurer, uh, assistant treasurer. We have uh, clerk. Uh, he goes into a section on how you should choose officers, and he, um, he lands on the idea that, and we would agree with that, that, that the choosing of officers should, be, uh, should incorporate the church as a whole somehow. Um, choosing of officers should not just be me saying, all right, well, I'm going to choose a couple elders to be with me, and I get to make the choice. Uh, no, it should come from the church. I think it can involve uh, the current elders, and, and so you have a, a good, robust uh, method for that. Uh, forms of church government. Here he has pictures, which are very helpful. So if you want to see how churches are set up, he talks about the Episcopalian government and how that is set up. Uh, he talks about the Presbyterian government and how that is set up. Uh, and then he gets to the congregational. And the congregational uh, model has uh, a couple different options to it. So the different options uh, within the congregational are the single elder or single pastor. Uh, so you see the picture there. And it's usually a single pastor with a deacon board and then congregation. Uh, so that's what, that's what the church was here when I arrived, was, was that model. Uh, another model is uh, uh, the pastor as part of the deacon board and then the congregation. And so you could almost make the case that that's kind of maybe how we functioned uh, when, when I got here too. So, uh, and then uh, plural local elders. And that's how we function as a, uh, as a church now, is that diagram on page 1146. A plurality of elders with the, um, myself as pastor being one of the elders. The dotted line from the congregation going up and over and down on the elders shows that uh, that's still within a congregationally ruled dynamic rather than an elder ruled. Another model is the corporate board model. Um, 
Another model is just pure democracy. Can you imagine that, where we just have to get together every Sunday and, and, and vote on every little thing, and that would seem a little laborious. So, and then there's another one. It's called the Blob uh, 1150. Um, just the congregation, no government, but the Holy Spirit. So I guess you just show up on a Sunday and you're not sure who's going to preach or who's going to teach or who's going to do anything. And uh, I don't know. So as the Spirit leads, right? There you go. And that's now. Um, should women be church officers? And in particular, should women be uh, pastors? Should women serve in the role of elder um, or pastor, overseer, bishop? So that's a, that's a question that Grudem spends a good chunk of time on here over the next or the rest of the chapter, uh, if you will. So... Um, I have never sat under a woman pastor, so um, the churches that I've belonged to, uh, I, I don't think it was ever maybe explicitly uh, in their doctrine that, that women could not be pastors, but there were no women pastors uh, in, the, in the circles where, uh, where I uh, grew up and then where I voluntarily attended. But should women be church officers? So that's a pretty present, uh, present day uh, question. Uh, it seems like some of the heat on that has dissipated in, in my estimation. Um, some people still make it a pretty big, um, big issue. I think there's other things out there. Like we've moved beyond, in some sense, I think we've moved beyond men and women questions. Uh, we're, we're moving into the realm of human questions, like what is a human? What does it mean to be human? Uh, and um, all this transgender uh, ideology that's being, being pushed upon us uh, is, is actually leading to almost a, uh, yeah, the, I don't know if you say it's the, the next thing because it's also part of it as well where those who are biologically women think they're men and those who are biologically men think they're women. Uh, now we are also, if it's called transhuman, uh, where um, those who are humans think that they can be cats or dogs or horses or whatever other animal that they might choose. Um, so that's, that's disturbing uh, that we've gotten to that, to that point. Uh, but so maybe I digress a bit and trying to avoid the question. So should women be in church office or should women in particular, we're just going to address tonight, should women uh, be in the role of elder, which would include pastor, overseer, um, So in approaching this, just so you understand some of the terminology that, that belongs to the um, discussion today, um, the, the language of egalitarian and complementarian, and complementarian with an E, not an I, so complementarian meaning that they fit together. So an egalitarian view, generally speaking, uh, which at one time was known as like evangelical feminism, but now it's called egalitarianism, uh, is a position in which uh, people say that um, there are no restrictions upon women regarding the roles that they can uh, attain or have within a church. Uh, that all roles are wide open to both men and women. There's an equal egalitarian uh, approach. A complementarian approach um, uh, begins with the idea that men and women are created differently, equal, uh, equal in their image of God, equal in their receiving the image of God and bearing the image of God, but there is a differing 
uh, aspect in their function or role. And we see that difference not only in uh, nature, uh, in how we're created, uh, but also we see uh, some restrictions even in scripture in which uh, women are told that uh, they are not to teach or have authority over a man. And that in particular is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. That's like the, uh, the main passage uh, regarding uh, women in ministry, really. It's not the only one, but it is the, it is the main one. Now, uh, in approaching this topic, uh, I could, man, I could, I could take a couple hours on this. Uh, I grew up, I could, you could say I grew up in a complementarian uh, church culture and even uh, societal culture. I grew up in a uh, in a time where um, men were called to be the, the head of the home as well as the leaders in the church. And that was that. Uh, it, it wasn't even really under discussion. And uh, nobody really even brought it up. Now, uh, as I look back on that, um, I don't think that I experienced so much a biblical complementarianism as I did a cultural complementarianism. I believe it was a, uh, even more so, I would, I would say it probably wasn't complementarianism. It was more patriarchalism is what I experienced growing up. Uh, what, da what dad said went, and um, uh, there was a sense that women were to be kept in their place. And that's, that's kind of how life went. And I look back on that, um, and I think there were things wrong with that. Um, and that's not to say that I disagree with the idea of biblical complementarianism, because I don't. Uh, what I disagree with is cultural patriarchalism. And we have to learn to distinguish the two. Um, Men don't just get to be the boss because they're men. And women don't just submit because they're women. Uh, we need to understand how this works biblically and who Christ is and what the church is and what is all going into this and how, how this works. So um, in making this discussion, now Grudem is very much in the complementarian camp. So one of the things I've handed out to you today uh, is the Danvers statement. So when this really kind of uh, became a, a real hot topic, uh, this Danvers statement was written back in 1987. And uh, the Danvers statement basically goes through and gives a rationale for why this statement is needed and then the purposes behind the statement. And then it gives their affirmations on the back page of, of what they affirm uh, to be biblical complementarianism. Okay, I, I can read through that statement and say, yep, that sounds... That sounds pretty right on. I, um, I would say personally, I affirm the Danvers statement. Now, one of the things that's happened over the last few years is even though I affirm the Danvers statement and the fact that I affirm it hasn't changed and that uh, we as uh, elders, uh, we, we've, we've read it, we affirm it as well. Uh, the church as a whole hasn't affirmed it. Uh, but one of the things that has changed over, uh, over the last few years uh, has been my willingness to understand where the other side is coming from and to understand where uh, the side I land on, what is uh, our particular sins that we struggle with, uh, rather than making it all about the other side being wrong and the sins that they struggle with. Uh, where, 
where does there need to be correction uh, on our side in rightly being um, biblical complementarians? Uh, what is biblical manhood? What is biblical womanhood? And how does that play out in a marriage? How does that play out in a church in a way that is honoring to God and recognizes the unique dignity and worth of both men and women in what God is doing? Uh, so one of the things I appreciate about Grudem as he goes through this Uh, there, is, there is sin on both sides, and that's one of the things that we need to be beware of. So the language of egalitarian and complementarian, so here's another uh, framework way of, of thinking. Uh, say all the way over here, I would say there's a, there's a category of what maybe could be called uh, liberal or cultural egalitarianism. So uh, it's, it's, there's, there's no difference between men and women uh, whatever men can do, women, women can do just as well or better. And so there's like equality and it's just all culturally based. Um, and then way on this side, I would say that there's a uh, very cultural driven um, or a, a longing to get back to what was culture driven, conservative, um, if you call it complementarianism, I think that's being uh, kind. It's more of a patriarchalism in which uh, men just see themselves as dominant. And that's not biblical. Uh, in the middle, I think you have those who see themselves as biblical egalitarians. If I, some people even cringe when I put those two words together. Uh, and also biblical complementarianism. So the idea that um, there are those who still revere the Bible and who seek to be led by and hold true to the scripture who land in a different spot than I do. It's those kinds of things that shake us a little bit, okay? So that's the other page I handed out to you. So there's, there's like two main groups, the, 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 the Center for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. That's the Danvers Statement, the CBMW. And then there's the CBE, Christians for Biblical Equality. So this is their... Uh, mission and value statement. Um, so they go through uh, and then they also provide a statement of faith uh, started at the, at the bottom of there. And then if you turn on the back, uh, some additional uh, faith statements and then some core values that they add on there as well. So that's one of the things that I have tried to endeavor to do, especially over the last, I don't know if it's been five years or it's been, it's been a few years where I want to honestly understand where other people are coming from. I don't want to just build up straw men to act like a hero when I knock them down. I don't want to do that. And so I like to read what the other side is writing uh, when I don't agree with them, I want to say, you know, is this, an, is this an honest disagreement? Or is this a um, dishonest uh, disagreement? Now, so what Grudem, Grudem does here is he starts at the beginning here uh, in, this, in this section towards the bottom of 1151. Um, so at the, at the end of the second full paragraph, uh, he writes, If the present controversy over women's roles in the church can result in the eradication of some of these past abuses, and he mentioned some of the past abuses, um, then the church as a whole will benefit greatly. 
And he says, yet the question remains, should women be pastors or elders in churches, or should they fill roles equivalent to that of an elder in churches or uh, churches that have alternative forms of government? Uh, so I, I appreciate that. And then uh, before we look at some of these things, I want to point out uh, his, his last, uh, one of the last things he says uh, on page 1170 under point eight. So he just gets done talking about uh, a bunch of objections to complementarianism. And he says, it is appropriate to end on a more positive note. Everyone reading this paragraph should recognize that God has given much insight and wisdom to women as well as to men, and that any church leaders who neglect to draw on the wisdom that women have are really acting foolishly. Therefore, any group of elders or other male leaders who make decisions affecting the entire church should frequently have procedures within the church whereby the wisdom and insight of other members of the church, especially the wisdom and insight of women as well as men, can be drawn upon as an aid in making decisions. So I find that to be uh, well-stated and wise advice, right? Um, so, in addressing the question, turn to 1 Timothy, chapter 2. First Timothy, chapter 2, uh, at verse 11. It says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Eve was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So there's a lot there. Uh, Grudem does a nice job of, of uh, breaking it down um, as he talks about, uh, talks about the meaning of verse 13 and the meaning of verse 14 uh, in particular. Um, but right before that, where he's talking about in, in 1 Timothy, understand that the context that Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's talking to Timothy about how to uh, shepherd a church or how to lead a church. And so he's talking about uh, the, the gathered church and what is appropriate for a church. Uh, so I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Uh, those same two words are used in 1 Timothy uh, 4, verse 11, in which Paul tells Timothy, command and teach these things. Uh, so that's the command is the, the idea of exercising authority and teach is teach. So in what Paul is doing here is he is, he is stating that uh, this, this position that Timothy had and the position that Timothy was to uh, make sure that uh, was being installed or being uh, put into place properly was the uh, position of elder and then the position of deacon. And that's all part of knowing how one ought to behave themselves within the household of God. And they're using family type language, the household of God. Uh, what is the proper way uh, to behave within the household of God? So the position that Grudem takes and the position that the Danvers statement, which Grudem helped to write, and he's part of that CBMW, um, is the position that the role of the, or the office of elder, which would be pastor, overseer, uh, that role that office is reserved for qualified men only, uh, that it's not open to uh, a woman holding that position. And he would go on and, and explain in, in verse 13, in verse 
14, he would say Paul is not attaching his argument to some local issue that's going on. Paul is going and reaching all the way back to creation in order to anchor his argument. He's saying, for Adam was formed first. Uh, then... Uh, then Eve, and then in verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So now there's a fun verse to talk about in a mixed audience, right? So um, some have taken that verse to say, well, see right there, it just goes to show you that women are more gullible than men. Uh, I've heard it taught that way. Um, and yeah, that's a... That's a, that's a sure, surefire way to get yourself in some trouble. Um, is that what's being taught here? Now, the role or the position that Grudem takes, if you look at the bottom of page 1153, what Grudem does here is he says, God gave men in general a disposition that is better suited to teaching and governing in the church, a disposition that inclines more to rational, logical analysis of doctrine and a desire to protect the doctrinal purity of the church. And God gave women in general a disposition that inclines more toward a relational, nurturing emphasis that places a higher value on unity and community in the church. Both emphases are needed, of course, and both men and women have some measure of both tendencies. But Paul understands the kinder, gentler, more relational nature of women in general as something that made Eve less inclined to oppose the deceptive serpent and more inclined to accept his words as something helpful and true. Yeah, so one of the issues that you run into there, um, saying that just men are um, more naturally predisposed to stand against um, error or deception is that there are a lot of guys who are deceived, right? <laughs> so, and, um, and then you're left to ask the question of uh, what, what did Adam really choose then when he chose to eat with, eat with Eve? Um, so, it's a, uh, it's a tricky, tricky passage, for sure. Uh, another translation or a major interpretation uh, that Grudem alludes to here. Um, is that uh, it says that verse 14 refers to a role reversal in the fall. The idea is that Eve took the initiative and decided to eat the forbidden fruit on her own. But in doing so, uh, but in doing this, she took a leadership role that belonged to Adam. Um, so I think there's some merit to that understanding as well. Um, so still, when we come down to it, uh, there does seem to be uh, something anchored in creation, the way God created us. And so the whole men and women issue, uh, we do need to understand what uh, nature teaches us, how God created us, and what Scripture teaches us, what God has revealed to us that uh, we wouldn't necessarily come to on our own just by nature. Men and women are different. Men and women uh, have different roles. We see that in our biology. Uh, men can't have babies, no matter what this world tells us nowadays. Um, Men can't. Uh, we're not designed to have babies or to feed babies. Uh, we are not given that capability. And so we see in our biology that there's a difference. We see in our biology that there is uh, generally a difference in uh, stature and strength. Uh, there are some general statements that we can make, although I could say uh, there, um, there are some women on this planet who could kick my butt in a hurry, <laughs> and, um, and I'd, I'd, I'd be laying on the ground shaking my head wondering what happened. So, but generally speaking, 
men are bigger and stronger than women and we're designed to be that way. And so even in how we're made, it speaks to the role God created for us. And how women are made speaks to the role that God has given to them. And if women have been given uh, the ability to have children, uh, to feed children, nurture children, you see that they are given gifts in those areas. And those things teach us something. And then in the scripture, we're told about how uh, men and women are different and what roles they are supposed to be part of and what roles they're to engage in and what they shouldn't engage in. So I agree with Grudem as he works through 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. Uh, I may not say everything the same way that he says about verse 14, because uh, I think there's a lot to be said, too, about how uh, men are often the ones leading uh, large groups of people astray. And if that's the case, uh, they are obviously very prone to deception as well. And so uh, it, it's, it's difficult to make a statement saying that, generally speaking, men are, uh, in a sense, more rational and less uh, disposed toward deception. That, that seems to be a, um, kind of a rocky, a rocky statement. Now, Grudem goes on to say uh, there's, there's all kinds of teaching and speaking by women that are encouraged by the Bible, so he covers that uh, starting at the bottom of page 1154. Um, he covers that, and then about the middle of page 1157, he addresses some of the objections related to 1 Timothy 2.12. Um, so as you read through that, you see uh, he addresses 10 uh, objections uh, to his understanding of 1 Timothy 2.12. And then he goes on to handle a couple other verses. And he says, then underneath all of that leads him to that statement that uh, the role or office of elder is reserved for uh, qualified men, according to scripture. Uh, so he mentions the relationship between the family and the church. And I think that's a big, big thing. Uh, there should be some reflection of uh, the nuclear family and, and how that plays out in the church. So generally speaking, um, in the home, uh, men are called to be the, the head. Uh, women were designed in the beginning to be helper, and that's not an inferior role. God himself is referred to as a helper. So helper, if thought of as inferior, you have to think of God as inferior, and I wouldn't recommend that. So helper is not an inferior role. It's a complementarian role. And so head and helper. But in the church, then, too, there should be a little reflection of that. We see the church is the family of God, the household of God. So I think what we agree to in the home or what we think the Bible teaches us about the home is going to be reflected in the larger than church family. Uh, he goes on, the, the examples of the apostles. Uh, Jesus appointed 12 men. Uh, there's no uh, disputing that. Um, he talks about the history of male teaching and leadership throughout the whole Bible. Uh, he says, from Genesis to Revelation, there's a consistent pattern of male leadership among God's people. And he goes on to say, there's not one example in the entire Bible of a woman doing the kind of congregational Bible teaching that is expected of pastors and elders uh, in the New Testament church. And then just the history of the church. The overwhelming pattern through the entire history of the church has been that the office of pastor elder or its equivalent has been reserved for men. 
Uh, although this does not demonstrate conclusively that such a position is correct, it should give us reason to reflect very seriously on the question before we rush ahead and declare uh, that almost the entire church throughout its history has been wrong on this issue. And that's a weighty uh, thing. Now, he talks about other objections than just to the entire complementarian position. And I think he gives uh, seven uh, arguments, yeah, and then as a sec seven objections. Now, what I find uh, compelling in, in some sense, and so, um, like, I have, a, I have a, a, a fellow Baptist pastor friend of mine who would identify himself more on the egalitarian side, but a biblical egalitarian in which um, he takes the scriptures seriously and Christ seriously. And, um, and he, uh, yeah, challenges me to, uh, yeah, look at some of the passages that I have easily assigned to my position in times past, just saying, well, Oh, that's a no-brainer. Duh. It's right there. It's clear as can be. Um, and doing the, doing the work of trying to, all right, what is the Scripture teaching? And being open to, uh, open to what the Scriptures say. So, having said all of that, we're about at time. But I want to end with this. There's a, and this is hopefully something that's come across throughout the uh, systematic class. There, there, it's important what doctrines we hold. Okay, so it's, it's important that we hold that which is true. Okay, but how we hold them is also important. And what I mean by that is, if you hold to the doctrine of a humble Christ uh, descending for us, uh, who, uh, being equal with God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, if you hold the doctrine of Christ, you can't hold that in arrogance, right? Like, it's, it's contrary to the very doctrine you're holding, to hold it arrogantly and use it as a way to uh, belittle others who maybe don't understand it like you do, or to use it as a club to beat others up. Or um, So what we believe is important. How we hold those beliefs and carry those beliefs is also important. Another example I would give is the idea of, uh, for example, uh, an arrogant Calvinist is, a, in an, is an oxymoron, okay? Uh, and an oxymoron is one who's like just a super moron. I'm just kidding. That wasn't very kind. Um, an oxymoron means it's, it's a contradiction, right? So a Calvinist is one who in his doctrine believes that all he has is a gift from God. Like all that he has, he's received. And if you've received it, then how can you arrogantly hold it and um, act as if somehow you're better than others, right? So what you believe is, is very important, but how you hold that belief and engage with others is also very important. And we often betray what we say we believe by how we interact with others. And this area of women in ministry is one of those areas that I've had to be chastised on a few times. Because at heart, I'm a male chauvinist. I grew up in a male chauvinist kind of arena, a patriarchal kind of culture and which men get to make the decisions, period. If I want input, I'll ask for it, but I don't need it. 
we can just make decisions. Uh, so this is an area where um, having to learn how to um, understand better uh, what being created male and female is and uh, how that plays out in a marriage and how that plays out in a church. Now, again, I still arrive at the conclusion that the Bible teaches that the role and office of elder or pastor is reserved for qualified men as qualified by Scripture. But how we hold that position needs to be held in very loving ways and considerate ways uh, and certainly not held in any type of way in which we give the impression that somehow because of that men are better. Uh, men are not better than women and women are not better than men. The best person to be a man is going to be a man, and the best person to be a woman is going to be a woman. Uh, but both men and women need to humble themselves before God and embrace the roles that God has called us to, but embrace them in a way that honors Christ. There we go. And read the next chapter on your own, Means of Grace, if you want to... Um, uh, if you want to enjoy growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, there's, there's ways to do it. Uh, you're not going to enjoy much growth if you neglect the local church, is basically the essence of the next chapter. Um, Easter Sunday, so next Sunday, no systematic. Uh, we'll be back April 7th, and on April 7th, what are the next two chapters? All right, there we go. So I'm going to cover baptism in the Lord's Supper, and Ron's going to cover worship. So. So one of the... Uh, so let me pray. That, that way I can officially say I'm done and not too late. Father, thank you for tonight. Uh, be gracious to us that uh, we may honor and serve you well. Uh, and do so for your glory and for our own good. Uh, so help us uh, to that end. Through Christ we pray. Amen.